In this video on complex numbers, we will be looking at operations on complex numbers when they are in rectangular form. The first video was an introduction, and we're moving on now. So let's get started. We now know what a complex number is. We've defined a complex number. So there's two things we're going to be defining first. Firstly, what does it mean for two complex numbers to be equal? It is an obvious definition, but it needs to be defined. So if I've got two complex numbers, x plus iy, a plus ib, then those two numbers are equal if x is equal to a and y is equal to b. So your gut feel will tell you, yes, they're equal if they look the same. And that is true, but we need to define it. So they're equal if the real components are the same and the imaginary components are the same. So then we look at how to add two complex numbers. Now, if you think of when you were introduced to numbers at a very young age, you first figure out what a number is, how do I count something, and then you do things with the numbers. You add them, you subtract them, you multiply them, you divide them. So we're going to be looking at similar things for complex numbers. So the first thing we're looking at is how to add complex numbers. It is a very obvious definition, intuitive. It's how you would probably think to add them. But if I've got two complex numbers, the way I add them, is by adding the real components and adding the imaginary components. So nothing strange about that definition. Let's look at an example. If z is minus 4 plus 3i and w is 6 minus 2i, then if I look at z plus w, it's minus 4 plus 3i plus 6 minus 2i. And it's defined that we add the real components, minus 4 plus 6, which is 2, and we add the imaginary component. So I've got 3i minus 2i, which leaves me with 1i. And that is how we add those two complex numbers. So there's nothing strange about adding complex numbers. We're not going to do more examples. When they're in rectangular form and we add them, it is very straightforward. But what I want to look at is some properties of addition of complex numbers. Now, there's a whole list here. I will look at them. But I'll just before we look at these properties, I'm going to remind you of the real numbers. Things you should already know about the real numbers. If I look at properties of addition in real numbers, I know that if I add two real numbers, I get a real number again. And this property is called closure under addition. I know that if I add A and plus B and C or A and B plus C, how I add them doesn't matter. It's associative. Addition is associative. And please notice it's addition that's associative. R isn't associative. Addition is associative in R, the way addition in real numbers is defined. Similarly, it's commutative. We've got an additive identity, which is the number zero. And these are just for real numbers. We'll look at the complex numbers shortly. And we have an additive inverse. For every real number, I can find another real number that if I add them, I get zero. All right? You should be comfortable with those properties. So let's look back at the complex numbers because addition in complex numbers, and I see a spelling error, addition in complex numbers also has certain properties. So let's take a look. In the complex numbers, addition is also closed under, or complex numbers is also closed under addition, which means if I add two complex numbers, I get a complex number again. Addition is also associative and commutative. I've got a zero, an additive identity. It looks a little bit different, it's 0 plus 0i, zero but that is just the number 0. And it's an additive identity in the complex number system as well, which means if I add it to any complex number, I get that number back. And similarly, for a complex number, I can generate an additive inverse by just taking the negatives of the a and the b components. So if I add those two numbers together, I again get 0, which is the additive identity. Now, Proving these theorems, we are going to look at, but I will do that in a later video. So for now, I'm just introducing the concepts and the definitions of addition and multiplication in rectangular form, but we will prove these theorems in a later video if you are interested in how to prove them. And to prove them, we will use the properties in R. All right, so let's look at multiplication. This one gets a little bit strange when we look at it, but I will clear it up for you. If I've got two complex numbers, Z and W, looking like that. If I multiply them, this is what we're told is happening. Ax minus By becomes my real portion and my imaginary part is Ay plus Bx. Now where does that come from? Let's rather look at an example and actually see where that comes from. I've got, no. If I've got 
4 minus 2i that I want to multiply with 3 plus i. Let's keep it simple. And we'll look at it in general form as well. If you think of how you multiplied out brackets when we looked at, in algebra, when we look at real numbers, how to multiply out brackets, it works the same way. This 4, I multiply with 3 and with the i. So I get 12 plus 4i. Then the minus 2, I multiply with both. And I get minus 6i minus 2i squared. All right. Now let's just clean that up a little bit. There's two terms with an i which is nice. So we're going to keep those together. I'm going to group them together and take i out as a common factor. You'll see now why I write it here on the right-hand side. And I've got a 4 minus a 6. The other two numbers, I've got a 12 and this number over here, minus 2i squared. Now remember when we defined the complex numbers, we said that i has the property that i squared is minus 1. So this is minus 2 times minus 1, which means it's plus 2. So this is what I've got. So I've got 14. That's a 4 minus 6 is minus 2. So 14 minus 2i. So that's what I get when I multiply out those two complex numbers. All right. Now let's look in general. If I'm looking at ZW and I've got it as A plus IB times X plus IY. If I multiply out the brackets, I get AX plus AIY plus IBX plus I squared BY. So it's the AX. I'm going to group it with this one because this becomes a real number. I squared is minus 1 BY, so it's minus BY. Plus, I can take I out as a common factor there, and I've got AY plus BX. So that's where this formula comes from. Now, if you like learning formulas, you can learn that formula and simply use it as it is. Or you can force it by multiplying out the numbers as we multiply out brackets. And that's the method I'm going to use because I do not feel like memorizing a formula. So we can use that. So let's just confirm that for this example, it actually works. If I use the formula for that example, I would get A times X. So Z times W, oh, it's the wrong way around. I've got the Z and the W, but it doesn't matter. So A times X, so it's 4 times 3 minus B times Y. So minus, minus 2 times 1, so it's plus 2 plus I times A times Y. So it's 4 times 1, so it's 4 plus B times X, which is minus 2 times 3, so it's minus 6. And that's what I... Got the same thing, it's 14 minus 2i. All right, so here I've just swapped around the z and the w. Apologies for that. That's actually w and that is z. But in principle, we know what's going on. So that is how we multiply complex numbers. All right, we're going to do some practice on that shortly. But just to take note, one more definition. And we don't have something like this quite like this in the real number. So that's something new. It's called a complex conjugate. So if I've got Z as A plus IB, then we say the complex conjugate of Z, fancy name, but we denoted Z with a bar on top, is defined as follows. It's A minus IB. So if my number Z is A plus IB, the complex conjugate is just Z minus a IB. So if Z is 4 minus 6I, then the complex conjugate is 4, and we change the sign, plus 6i. So we multiply that b value with a minus 1. So that's the complex conjugate. If we look on the argon plane, if I represent z, this z is 4 minus 6i, so it's over here somewhere, then the complex conjugate will be over there somewhere. So we notice it reflects about the real axis because it's the imaginary portion that changes sign. So that is the complex conjugate and we'll see later where we use it and why it is valuable. All right, so let's look at these two numbers, z and w. If I want to find out what is z times w, it's minus 4 plus 3i times 6 minus 2i. And then you can choose which way you want to multiply, but we've got minus 24 plus 8i, plus 18i, minus 6i squared. 
I'm writing that out. I'm not doing this in my head because you've got to remember that the I squared is minus 1. So I've got minus 24 plus 6. So minus 24 plus 6 is minus 18. I've got 8i and 18i, so I've got 26i. So there we go. That's how we multiply. If I want the complex conjugate of z, it's minus 4 minus 3i. If I want the complex conjugate of w, it's 6 plus 2i. And we can look at other things. I can look at the complex conjugate of zw. So that means take z times w, first multiply it, and take the complex conjugate. And that's minus 18 minus 26i. So then we have to wonder, is there a relationship between the complex conjugate, z times w's complex conjugate, and the complex conjugate and z time, and the complex conjugate of w? Is there a relationship between those two numbers? Now you can multiply these two numbers on the left-hand side here and see if we get the same answer, but we will formalize it shortly. All right, so complex numbers like Addition, multiplication also has a bunch of properties. So I'm going to go over these a bit faster and them as well come from the equivalent properties in real numbers. So I'm not going to read through those. You can pause them and read through them. But look at it at complex numbers. Multiplication is closed under complex numbers. It's associative. It's commutative. We've got a multiplicative identity. That's the number one. And it's the same as the multiplicative identity in R. And if I multiply any complex number with that number, it stays the same. We've got a multiplicative inverse. Now, this one looks a little bit ugly. This is what it looks like. We'll talk a bit later about where we use it and how to simplify this process, but this is what the multiplicative inverse looks like, and it's got the property if I multiply it with z, I get 1. Now, this you can check, but like I said in a later video, I'll look at some proofs of these. And then combining addition and multiplication, we've got the distributive law. We also have this for real numbers, but it also works for complex numbers. And then the complex conjugate, there's some theorems linked to that, which we will also prove at a later stage. I just want to let you know. If I multiply a number with its complex conjugate, I get a real number. So go test it for 1 or 2. We will prove it formally later, but go test it for 1 or 2 and see if we multiply a number with its complex conjugate that I get a real number. Also, if the product of a number and its complex conjugate is 0, then both the number and the complex conjugate is zero. There's no other option. The second theorem is the complex conjugate of the complex conjugate gets us back to the number z. Now that would make sense. If z is 4 minus 3i, the complex conjugate is 4 plus 3i, and the complex conjugate of that is 4 minus 3i. So I get back to z. Now this is not a proof. This is just an example. You need to prove it in general if you want to prove it. And here's what we talked about earlier. The sum of the complex conjugates is the same as the complex conjugate of the sum and same for product. And then if I've got a non-zero number z, the multiplicative inverse, remember that ugly number we had on the previous slide, the multiplicative inverse can also be represented as this, which looks a little bit simpler than the big formula we had on the previous page. So that is addition and multiplication and complex conjugates in complex numbers.